I'm going to introduce you. The, the bios are actually, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Hunan is a dramatist, a poet, and a researcher. And he's gotten the Akbar Rati Prize for the best young dramatist of Iran in 2008 and 2009. Shortlisted, he's um, the head of the Dramatic Literature Association of Iran's House of University Theater. He won the Arts Award category. He's runner up and shortlisted for the Postgraduate International Student of the Year. So you are much lauded. And he's just finished his PhD, so he's graduating in December. So, um, the Welkin Sources Rain Ash is the evolution of a few lines into a full length play. Go. Thank you very much, Eri. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection uh, to land, waters, and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and to elders, both past and present. Uh, for this presentation, I would like to start with a plot summary of the original source text of this play, Siavash's Story. Um, the Siavash's Story is one of the most famous parts of the Iranian national epic Shahnameh, written by Ferdowsi. It tells of a handsome and desirable prince who was uh, loved by his stepmother and the queen of the country, Sudabe. Because Siavash refused to betray his father, the queen accused him of rape. To find out the truth, the king forced them both to prove their innocence by passing through iron, an ancient test in which liars will burn. Uh, Sudabe refused to undergo the test, but Siavash passed it successfully. The king decided to punish his wife, but the prince asked him not to. After a series of incidents, Siavash went on a self-imposed exile in Turan, the Netherlands, to be away from the queen. The prince got murdered in Turan, and Iranians accused Sudabe of being the main reason to his death. So they killed him. Uh, the Siobash story has its roots in an ancient time. Uh, there are numerous versions of the story in existence, but none has gained the status of Ferdowsi's version. The first version dramatic of Siobash story was written in early 20th century. And this one, The Wilkins Horses Rain Ashes by Nahman Samini, is a free adaptation of that, which was written in 2006. The play focuses on the fire test because for her, it is the most imaginative part of the story. So, whenever I do it, this is a quotation. <laughs> Just, um, <laughs> although Ferdowsi described this image in only a few lines, Samini develops the idea into a full length play. She claims that. This is the most important part of Siavash's Siobash, life. The other parts show an outer drama, while we could consider passing through fire Siavash's inner drama. It is as if he passes through his inner fire, the fire of doubts and fears. Uh, in adapting the Siavash story into the Wilkins horses, Sami changes the plot, most of the characters, and the form of the language present in Ferdos' rendition. Here, I will go uh, through the writer's inspiration as well as a formal exploration of the play. Uh, in 2005, theater director Ali Razi asked Samini to collaborate on a multicultural project about Siavash. They decided to stage a contemporary adaptation of this story. For Then, for Samini, Siavash gradually became a contemporary intellectual who experiences passivity, depression, and fears. To develop the idea, she used images that the director shared with her. Razi also helped her to develop the characters and edit the play. Samini's work shared the genre of magic realism. This is very common in fiction, but not in drama, especially not in Persian drama. Um, Samini admits that she has always liked to play with time. Magic realist ideas are inseparable from my thoughts. In the end, even my most realist ideas turn into magic. I only want to follow my heart. Insanity, magic, and imagination in the structure of drama make me feel happy. I will never stop writing in this form. This genre fascinated Samini uh, since she read 1001 Nights, aka Arabian Nights. Uh, in this book, you can find endless stories, tales, characters, and lives. 
Even the audiences who prefer other performance forms to their stories enjoy listening to them, she says. For Samini, the task of the artist is to please the audience. And she has chosen storytelling to fulfill that purpose. The most significant plays of Samini are also magic realist works. They connect important eras of Iran's history with contemporary political events. Inspired by 1001 Nights, Samini makes ordinary people uh, the focus of her work. Compared to other works of literature such as Shah Nameh, 1001 Nights talks about marginalized people. The stories of famous figures have been told many times, but marginalized people have untold tales that might turn into fascinating dramas. In her opinion, history is written by the historians. That's their task. The task of the dramatist is to write the untold parts of history. Apart from her creative works, Samini has researched and written about 1001 Nights. Her PhD thesis titled Myth and Archetype in Iranian Dramatic Literature still represents the most significant study of adapting myth in dramatic in Iranian theater. In this thesis, she analyzes the connections between Iranian dramatic texts and Persian myth and archetypes using a structuralist perspective. A formal exploration of the play. Samini challenges the norms of adapting myth in Iranian theater. Most works that draw on Shah Nameh remain faithful to the source text. The authors choosing to adapt the epic's uh, the epic poem's most familiar parts. Samini, however, prefers to explore the untold parts of the Siyavash story. If we consider classical literature a museum that has to, pre to be preserved by theater, we will go the wrong way, she states. Our task is not to encourage people to get to know the classic literature. Rather, we need to discover our culture disconnection from the past and try to find ways to connect the present era with the past, a kind of discovering slash building identity by referring to the, young, to the old culture. Samini declares that if we aim to dramatize a narrative slash story for this stage, first we need to explore the work's themes and both inner and outer meanings. We need to study it as a living creature. If we don't know all the aspects of the original source text, we will not be able to write a good adaptation. Samini also says that I never reproduce the myth directly. I admit that I use mythic structure, however. In this way, for example, uh, she has been influenced by Joseph Campbell's classic work of comparative mythology, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Campbell argues that all myths uh, share fundamental structure, which he calls monomyth. Campbell's monomyth consists of a number of stages along this adventure. The hero begins in the, only, in the ordinary world, but supernatural powers or happenings draw the hero into a call to adventure. If the hero accepts the call, they encounter a road of trials. In the most dramatic case, the hero will encounter a significant challenge which must be overcome, often with the assistance of help and advice found along the way. Should the hero survive, they earn important knowledge, self-discovery, a newly acquired wisdom or gain or gift, which then requires the decision to return to normal world. The hero is usually confronted with challenges on the journey to return to the ordinary world. Upon a successful return, the gain or gift may be applied to improve the broader ordinary world. It's called also the application of the boom. It is uncommon for me to contain all of these stages. Some of them go for only one, some of them for many, some of them for all. But um, we can also uh, uh, like explain this uh, structure in three sections. The first departure or separation begins with the hero starting the quest. The second initiation shows the adventures which the hero encounters and finally return in which new knowledge, power, or gains return home with the hero to the ordinary world. So we can apply this structure to the play. I'll read you the, uh, the plot summary with uh, these terms. The mother applies to the Velkin's horses, Rain Ashes, accused of being 
um, with the stepmother, Siavash has to pass through fire to prove his innocence that's called to adventure. His mother comes to his dream and tells him that this trial did not end the story, but before she finalizes uh, her words, the prince waves. Mer, Siavash's companion, tries to dissuade him from starting this journey, but she fails. He passes through fire and begins the adventure. It's leaving the ordinary world. And then he encounters some characters, a headless soldier, soldier's lover, Sita, monk, Sita's embryo, man hyphen woman, and man hyphen woman's brother. Um, in this road of trial, they all ask him about, uh, they, he asked them about the missing part of the dream. So it's seeking assistance. Soldier clarifies that Siavash will safely pass the fire test, but in less than 10 days, will be asked by the king to go on a war. Then soldier asks the prince to disobey the king's order, which Siavash promises to do. However, he then faces the displaced and stateless Sita, whose husband is with the goddess of lust. Embryo claims that Sita cannot bear him unless, unless sorry, she is on Embryo's father's soil. Sita asks Siavash to build a city which is not foreign to anyone so that uh, she can finally bear a child. Siavash promises to do so. Sita also verifies that Siavash will not go to war and consequently will be exiled by his father. Siavash encounters man-woman who is born to betray. He, she wants Siavash to listen to his her story in order to share the missing part of the dream with him. Man-woman has killed his her brother because he had married a woman from a foreign tribe. Then Siavash realizes years later in exile, man-woman or someone similar to him her will betray and behead him. Man-woman tells Siavash that if he wishes to continue his life after beheading, he must forgive his betrayer and executioner. The prince accepts. Likewise, he realizes that Mer is the missing part of his dreams, so that's the gift for him. However, there is only a small aperture for just one person to pass through fire. Due to Siavash's promises, Mer sacrifices and dies. And then from that point, Siavash passes and returns to the ordinary world and fulfills all his promises. That's the application of the boon. He does, he does not see his mother in his dreams anymore, but sometimes dreams about um, fire, which is always followed the next morning by the Welkin raining ashes and clouds looking like mare, who calls Siavash from the sky. The, the prince remembers that if he was betrayed, he would forgive his betrayer, and the play finishes. Samini acknowledges that for her, designing a structure is the most fascinating part of drama, and writing dialogue is the most horrifying part. And it becomes even more horrifying when she has to translate it into French, because as we see, the translation is much longer. And imagine two actors on the stage, they have to go on time and they have to pronounce the same dialect on the stage, so that will be a big trouble. By the way, he was happy with the, with the French translation of the play. Apart from that, um, there are some other issues with the dialects. I would like to show you the next slide, and in which I should read you from the paper. The audience might face difficulties in understanding the ambiguity of Samini's language and the density of some of the elements, particularly the ones borrowed from Indian culture. Here's an example which presents a complicated context in a few lines, but doesn't reveal any clear links to place story or structure. Sita is describing the meal she was hoping to prepare for Siavash, a meal which includes spices from the farthest Hindu islands the hottest pepper from Krishna's forests and cooked with the oil taken from Shiva's snakes together with some bread baked with the water of the holy river Ganga. So, uh, Samini admits that the Velkin's horses rain ashes wasn't a good experience of writing bilingually because she was overthinking it, as she says. 
Apart from Siavash, none of the play's characters are drawn from the source text. Soldier, Sita, man, pipe, and woman, and more importantly, Mer do not exist in Shahnameh. Mer could be either Siavash's mother or his lover. This remains ambiguous in the end. You can just guess. Um, despite Ferdos' negative image of the female character in the original source text, here uh, the character of Mer is a strong, caring, and um, active throughout the play. Samini considers her an ideal woman because she is boundless, loves fearlessly, and possesses a strong identity. For Samini, Siavash is also a special character. He repeats this dialect several times through the play. Mercy for the betrayer, mercy for the executioner. Because, uh, and also before dying, for the very last time, he says that. Um, Samini believes, Siavash says that, not because of passivity, but because he knows the meaning of violence and the cycle followed by that. As in the original story, um, uh, Samini, actually, uh, I forgot to say that, this is, in the original story, it looks like that the, pers the character is very passive. And that's one of the reflections of the culture and that character. They don't like that act of his because he looks very passive. Uh, Samini comments that I'm talking about the cycle of violence. Once violence is used, it inevitably leads to more violence. And she tries to connect it for, with the uh, contemporary era. Through representing Siavash's fire journey, Samini develops an approach that is both multicultural and intertextual. For example, Siavash tells his father that he will not be the first or the last to be to commit to filicide. In this, he's comparing himself with Sohra, another character in Persian myth who was killed, who was killed by his father. In addition, Samini uses the exaggerated mask of Far East performances for the character Man Woman. She also quotes a poem by Mexican poet Octavio Paz and adapts the Indian myth Sita for her story. Hence, Samini's play becomes a multicultural work as well. She says, for me, the stage is where we can realize the, imag the imagination, somewhere between two worlds, between utopia and reality, a realized utopia. For me, stage is a visible utopia. In January 2006, the Velkin's Horses Rain Ashes was first performed at the Iranian, at, the, at Iran's Farj International Theatre Festival in Tehran. It was staged in both Persian and French, with two actors performing all the roles, one in Persian, one in French. Um, they chose French because they thought um, it has many speakers in the world and can broaden their uh, the number of the audiences. Uh, the performance was captioned, so if the audience was unfamiliar with one of the languages, sure he could follow it while captioning. Nevertheless, the ambiguity of the dramatic language and having only two actors for all the roles resulted in difficulties for some audiences. At times, they couldn't track the storyline and had to either focus on the captions or on the movements. Uh, likewise, the actors' unfamiliarity with each other's language led them to concentrate on one another's movements. As it was uh, like a very minimal stage, if they had made any mistake, it could have been realized by the audience easily. Um, the Belkin's Horses Rain Ashes was performed in France as well as in some additional Iranian cities, but was never staged in India, the source country of some elements of the play. Although it wasn't as well received as her earlier plays, Shake Lack or Sleeping in an Empty Cup, this work is known as one of the most experimental adaptations of Shah Nameh in Iran. Thank you. <laughs>